Okay, so we are, let's move on to the third video of this lecture, which is on tensor products. Um, let me just say a word before we go on, which is, for, us, for many of you, this might be too much all at once. Um, um, so, you know, take it in whatever doses you, you, you can digest it, and um, um, let's see, so um, some of this stuff, you know, some of the th things that I'm speaking about, of course, it's just a formalization of stuff you've already seen in the, in the previous lectures, especially these um, uh, tensor products. You know, we've implicitly been using them um, for the last couple of weeks. Um, and hopefully this only, you know, this only help, helps clarify to you what the, what the underlying math behind it, behind it all is. Okay, so, so with, that, with that small warning, let's, uh, let's just go on and let's talk about tensor products. So let's, let's go back and remember what a qubit was. So, so remember we, you know, our picture of it was, was like this. We have a hydrogen atom. It's electron. We think of it as being either in the ground state, which we think of as a as representing zero, and an excited state, which we think of as a, as representing one. And now, of course, the state of this this qubit is is a unit vector in. So it's it's some unit vector phi in a two-dimensional complex vector space, which we call a Hilbert space. Okay. Um, we call it a Hilbert space mainly because it's a it's a complex vector space with a defined inner product. And then, you know, there's this additional property that we want from Hilbert spaces when when they are you know which is which is more complicated when they are infinite and infinite dimensional Hil Hilbert spaces. So when we talk about continuous quantum states, but in this course we are not going to deal with all those subtleties about the completeness, you know, limits, and so on. So, uh, formally, we'll only think about finite-dimensional Hilbert spaces, and then when we talk about continuous quantum states, we'll just do it intuitively. Okay, so, so back here, okay, so we have, we have a qubit, it's a unit vector in this two-dimensional complex vector space, which we're calling a Hilbert space, and, and now let's say we have another such electron in another hydrogen atom, And so, of course, its state also is a unit vector in a, in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, but, but now, of course, in general, we know that we cannot really talk about, if we are given the two hydrogen atoms together, we, have, we are given these two qubits together, we cannot, in general, talk about the state of the first qubit and the state of the second qubit separately because of the phenomenon of entanglement. So, in general, we cannot talk about any more about the state of the first qubit and the state of the second qubit. But we still have these two Hilbert spaces associated with the first qubit and the second qubit. So now, what happens when we bring these two qubits together? Okay, so what we already saw is that when we think of this as a composite system, there's actually a four-dimensional complex vector space associated with it. And the basis for this state is all the classical possibilities, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. But still, you can ask, what was the operation by which we, we, we took two such complex vector spaces, two-dimensional complex vector spaces, and we glued them together to get a four-dimensional complex vector space. What is this operation? So if we call this Hilbert space H1, and we call this Hilbert space H2, then what's the operation that we perform on these two Hilbert spaces to get this new Hilbert space H, which is a four-dimensional complex vector space? So this operation is called a tensor product. And when we perform this tensor product, what we do is 
we, look, we take a basis vector from the first Hilbert space, like 0, and a basis vector from the second Hilbert space, like 0, and we take a, take a tensor product between them. Okay, and well, it might be, you know, just to just for clarity, it might be, it might be a little easier for you to understand if I write them a little closer together. So I take, okay, so let's 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 erase all this and let's call this, uh, let's call this this one h1, h2, and we've taken a tensor product between them. So we are taking a basis vector from the first Hilbert space, one from the second Hilbert space and we take a tensor product of them. And this tensor product we also write as, so when we write 0 tensor 0, we also, you know, this is what we've been calling 0, 0. Right? And sometimes we'll also write, write it just as ket 0, ket 0. So this is what we mean by saying, well, the, the first electron was in the state 0 and the second electron was in the state 0. Similarly, if you take the tensor product of these two, we, we can also abuse notation and write it like, like this or like that, and so on for, the, for, the, for, the, uh, for each of the four cases. Okay. And then, okay, so this is how we glue these two Hilbert spaces together and got a new Hilbert space, new complex vector space, which is now four-dimensional. Okay, we can also ask, you know, of course we can we can glue together any vector here and any vector here. So if we had if we had a state phi one in the first Hilbert space and phi two in the second Hilbert space, we could we could glue them together by putting this this symbol in between them, and this is what you know. So, for example, if we had um, if we had the state one over square root two zero plus one over square root two one in the first Hilbert space, and one over square root two zero minus 1 over square root 2, 1 in the second Hilbert space. And if it took a product of these, a tensor product, this is what we were, we were writing informally just by writing a product. And now when we take tensor products, it's distributive as, you know, exactly the rules that we followed. And we'd write the answer as 1 half 0 times is tensor 0 minus 1 half 0 tensor 1 plus 1 half 1 tensor 0 minus 1 half 1 tensor 1. Okay, that's what, um, that's what the um, tensor product of two states would look like. We could also ask, well, what happens if you, if you look at two such states, phi 1 tensor phi 2 and psi 1 tensor psi 2. What's the inner product between them? And the answer is, it's just the inner product between phi 1 and psi 1. So whatever the states are in the first, in the first Hilbert space, times the inner product between phi 2 and psi 2. Okay, finally, let's look at the more general case. So now suppose we have a we have a k state particle, a k state sorry, a k state quantum system. So if the first Hilbert space is a k dimensional Hilbert space, and let's say Let's say, let's say the second Hilbert space is is made up of an L state quantum system. So H2 is an L-dimensional complex vector space. 
So this has a basis 0 through k minus 1, let's say. And let's call these basis vectors, say, 0 through l minus 1. Okay, so now what happens when we glue these two together, when we put them together and call this one big system? So we get some Hilbert space H, and H is the tensor product of H1 and H2. Okay, what's, what's another way of saying it? Well, another, you know, the intuitive way of saying it is, look, you had a quantum system here, the first one, where you could be in one of these k distinguishable states, 0 through k minus 1, or in any superposition of these. In H2, you can be in one of L distinguishable states, or any superposition of those. And so when you put them together, what are the distinguishable states? Well, you could be in 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2 through 0, L minus 1, or 1, 0, 1, 1 through 1, L minus 1, so they are exactly k times l dif different distinguishable states. So h, it's a k times l dimensional space. And again, you know, the, the, the basis vectors in h are going to be tensors, tensor products of basis vectors in h1 and h2. So they're going to be of the form 0 tensor 0, 0 tensor 1, 0 tensor L minus 1, 1 tensor 0, 1 tensor L minus 1, all the way to K minus 1 tensor 0, K minus 1 tensor L minus 1. Okay, so they are exactly K times L of these. And of course, your state can be any linear combination of these. Again, remember by abuse of notation, we, 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 can, we are going to denote this state also by, by this, or also by, by that. Okay, so now, there's something to think about here. There's something very interesting going on here. Okay, what, what's this interesting thing? So if you were to write a state of, of your first system, how many parameters would you need for that? Well, since it's a k-dimensional system, you need k complex numbers to describe your state in of, of the, your first system. How many, how many parameters would you need if you were just to put, describe a state in your second system? Well, you need exactly L complex numbers to describe a state in your second system. But now if you put them together, if you call your system the union of of your first and second um, quantum system, then you need k times l complex numbers. Okay, so it's worth thinking about this intuitively. What would have happened if this was a classical system? Let's say that um, you know, you had some system where you needed a million parameters to describe describe your system. So, for example, what's what's a what's a system where you need a million parameters to describe it? Well, let's say it's the memory in your computer. So, let's say that you got a got a mem you know you 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 bought a mega megabit megabyte of uh, memory. So, ten to the six, you need ten to the six numbers to describe what the state of that memory is. And now you're running short of memory. So you go out and you purchase another, you know, some more RAM. So it's, you know, let's say you purchase another 10 to the 6 megabytes. How much memory do you have? Well, 
you have 10 to the 6 plus 10 to the 6, which is 2 times 10 to the 6. Right? They add up. So the number of parameters you need to describe the state of your system once you have once you have once you've added this new memory in is just the sum of the parameters you needed for the first one and the parameters you needed for the second one. What happens if this was a complex system? Uh, sorry, a, a, a quantum system. So you needed 10 to the 6 parameters for your first system, your first quantum memory, 10 to the 6 for the second one, right? If you use them individually, but if you put them together and call the whole thing one big system, now you need 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 6. So instead of a megabyte, you now end up with a terabyte of memory. This sounds ridiculous, but this is, this is really, you know, this is the basic fact about quantum mechanics or quantum systems which make them so strange and therefore also so useful from a computational viewpoint. Okay, one last thing to help you think about this. So how could it be that you needed only k complex numbers to describe a state in H1, L to describe a state in H2, but now if you put, put the two systems together, you need k times L complex numbers. How could this be? What, what's going on? Well, the answer is entanglement. Okay, so, so why is the answer entanglement? So, so you, you had H1, where you needed k complex numbers, you had H2, where you needed L complex numbers. So if you had a state phi1, you need only k parameters to describe phi1, a state of, H, of, of the first comp, uh, quantum system. If you have phi2, the state of the second quantum system, you only need L parameters, L complex numbers to describe it. If your state of the two systems is of the form phi1 tensor phi2, you only need k plus l parameters to describe it. But remember, the state of your composite system does not need to be a product state. In general, it's going to be an entangled state. And these states cannot be described using k parameters on the, on the first space and l parameters in the second space. And that's the reason why, in general, um, most of the states of this, of this composite system are going to be entangled. And this is why we need k times l parameters to describe a general state of this composite uh, quantum system which we describe by the helper space H, which is H1 tensor H2. Okay, so uh, how much of this should you understand? Well, you know, it depends upon um, it depends upon how deeply you want to get into the subject, but hopefully this gives you some sense of the, you know, of solid ground in terms of what all these symbols that we've been using so far, what all these operations we've been using so far mean. Um, so use it, you know, use this, uh, this lecture. I, I guess um, what I should say is um, try to digest as much of this as you find comfortable. And, you know, I'll try to be as gentle as possible going forward and use, use this notation as sparingly as possible. Okay.